Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. Um, today, not really a theorem. Well, actually, there will be a theorem, but it will be a bit kind of hidden, more like uh, what I want to explain is a problem. And the problem are the compute those so-called Kronecker coefficients. And I'm trying to explain, it's one of my favorite problems of all time. And I'm kind of thinking about it like all the time, not all the time, but from time to time, I, I uh, tend to think about it. Um, and it's a very difficult problem. So I, I don't expect that I have any solution anytime soon, or maybe I actually don't even expect that anyone has any solution anytime soon. It's a very difficult problem. As you can see from my subtitle, that's what I believe. And it's in representation theory. And I'm trying to formulate this without ever using the notion of representation theory at all, which is a bit of a, well, we'll see. It's a double-edged sword. We'll see how that works out. So I'm trying to motivate the question and I'm trying to motivate the question in a way that actually this is one specific problem, but it's actually a part of a general kind of philosophy or observation or law of nature, whatever you want to call it. So even if you don't know representation theory, um, you should, but anyway, um, even if you don't know it, it's hopefully reasonably enjoyable what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, and there's this old problem, fairly old from the 1930s, to compute a certain type of numbers that are associated to my favorite group ever. Is that really true? Anyway, the symmetric group. And it turns out that these are really difficult. And, and that's very strange from a certain point of view, because usually kind of the symmetric group is this one group which we understand reasonably well um, until you look too closely. And here's one where you look too closely. Okay, so let's just get started. So my slogan always is symmetry is everywhere. So whenever I need to write a grant proposal or something, I need to find money for my research, like symmetry is everywhere is uh, always a good starting slogan. Whether it's good or not, I don't know, but I usually use that. Um, and I use it here as well. Uh, symmetry is everywhere. Nature is designed symmetrically, right? So really, it's really everywhere. And mathematically, the mathematical study of symmetry um, depends a bit for type of flavor you want to go for, but I'm, today I'm going for uh, a representation. So representation theory, the field I mentioned before, is essentially the study of the mathematical study of symmetries. So you can imagine something like uh, uh, whatever this is, an atom, and it has some nice symmetry. Here you have uh, a symmetry by reflecting around this axis. So there's some group acting, and to describe the action of this group, usually use a representation. Here's a more sophisticated symmetry. You have more axis of rotations and more reflection type things and whatever. So, so representations can vary a lot. And they usually, I would like you to think of them as being mathematical way, a mathematical way to encode uh, symmetries. And strictly speaking, I should say the real difference is that representation theory takes the approach to make everything push everything into the world of linear algebra. So a representation is a linear algebra object. So there are matrices that you can play with matrices and eigenvectors and eigenvalues, right? So here a reflection matrix or a rotation matrix, or something like that, a bunch of matrices. And whenever you have a, a theory, what you really should do is, and it turns out representation theory is like, like really, really useful. Um, symmetry is everywhere, right? So um, it turns out what you should, you should do is you should write out a periodic table or you should define what a periodic table is. You have should have a notion of elements in your theory. It's the basic building blocks of your theory. And the basic building blocks of representations, so of symmetries, if you want, they're called simple representations. Or uh, I just call them simples. The simple representations, the easiest type of symmetries you can imagine. And what I've just said is the following. So we have some bunch of matrices and we can decompose them into smaller building blocks. And the smallest ones you find that still respect your symmetry, you call them simple or simple representations. Sometimes irreducible representations, but I find the word simple a bit more catchy. Uh, that's why I'm using simple. Anyway, and the study of simple representations really correspond to the study of simple symmetries, the easiest type of symmetries, the basic symmetries, the Lego piece symmetries, kind of want to nail down the symmetries because they kind of are everywhere. So maybe you just start by nailing down the ba basic Lego pieces of symmetries. And that's essentially summarizing what representation theory is all about on one slide. I hope that analogy works. You essentially don't need to know much more about it 
Um, well, you should, as I said, but maybe not for today. And kind of the easiest type of symmetry, not the easiest type of symmetry, the easiest type of symmetry is something like on this slide, like a rotation or a reflection, there's some dihedral groups or some cyclic groups going on, uh, something like that. But another type of symmetry you will, well, eventually hit, and it's not quite obvious why this is a symmetry, but it definitely is, is shuffling symmetry. So the deck of cards, you could shuffle it through, but you don't change the deck of cards, right? So the deck of cards has a shuffling symmetry. And mathematically speaking, one organizes um, shuffling symmetries into the, one organizes symmetries by organizing them corresponding to groups. So you study representations of a certain group as a certain type of symmetry. Uh, five-fold symmetry is like representations of the circular group in five elements or with five elements. And shuffling symmetries are associated to the symmetric group, uh, the shuffling group, the permutation group, whatever you want to call it. I just call it shuffling symmetries. And shuffling symmetries are really everywhere. So here's my, uh, my example. So actually the triangle, for example, has a shuffling symmetry because it could, sh could just shuffle the vertices around without changing the triangle. So I've marked the triangle with a green, um, what is it, a red, and uh, what is it, blue a a a arrow, marker, whatever. I marked it such that the symmetry of the triangle is broken. But the markers will help you to see actually that there is a symmetry, because now, or a shuffling symmetry, because now I can shuffle those uh, colors around, and I still get the triangle back. So the triangle has a shuffling symmetry. For example, I can shuffle one to two, or so in this example here, I shuffle one to two, I shuffle two to three, and three to one, or I shuffle, uh, so this is the same, one is green, so I shuffle green to red. Green goes to where red was before, um, red goes to where blue was before, and blue goes to the remaining slot. I can just shuffle things around. So the triangle actually has a shuffle symmetry. The more standard shuffle symmetry is the one of the deck of cards, but shuffle symmetries are kind of everywhere. And one could hope it's like the symmetric group. Maybe that's not so difficult to describe. But can we describe some of the basic shuffle symmetries? What can we say about them? Um, it turns out that the triangle is not a basic shuffle symmetry, and that's easy to see. It has a subspace given by, we are in a linear world, by just taking the sum of green, red, and blue, which is clearly fixed. So there's some subsymmetry with a very boring one, the non-symmetry, but there's some subsymmetry. So it's not it's not simple itself, but it's an example of a shuffle symmetry, right? So the deck of cards is the same example. It's another example of shuffle symmetry. And turns out that to classify the simple shuffle symmetries is not not that difficult. Or let's just say it was done a few uh, a few, few days ago days ago, <laughs> a little bit of a while ago, like in 1895, uh, that's about 130 years while recording this video. So it's quite a while back and it's a really beautiful answer. It's not that difficult. The answer is the shuffle symmetries are indexed by integer partitions. So by those little funny things here. So an integer partition, for example, four plus two plus one plus one, and I can just do it by putting four boxes here, two boxes here, one box here, one box here. Four plus four is another, in this case of eight. In this case of eight, I can put them here. And if you would like to think of in terms of symmetric groups, then these are just the cycles in a permutation. So a permutation could do this, for example, fixing this guy and this guy. And here you have a longer cycle of length four and you have a shorter cycle. Or you, here you have two cycles of length four. And we are not interested where they really happen, so that's why we get integer partitions. And it turns out that the cycles in the symmetric group correspond to integer partitions, and integer partitions correspond to simple shuffle symmetries. And this is really, really, really remarkable result. And those simple shuffle symmetries, I, I denote them just by V lambda, where lambda is one of those guys here. Um, there you go. Simple shuffle, symmetry, simple shuffle symmetries. What a difficult word. I should have chosen a different word, I guess. But anyway, uh, why different? It's, a, it's just a mouthful. Let me try again. Simple shuffle symmetries. Not so bad. The simple shuffle symmetries are indexed by something very easy. And you can say much more about them. You can compute the dimensions and what dimensions do they live. You can compute characters. If you know what that is, you can compute a lot of things. Turns out that this is an easy problem. In some sense, at least, it's an easy problem, which is remarkable. Because kind of thinking about it, just as I just explained it, 
classify the elements of shuffle symmetry. I'm not so clear how we would do that, but it has a very satisfying answer. So you might wonder whether you can actually do something with that. And it turns out, at least in this for um, this talk or for this video, you can't because some of the next step, the next thing you would try, kind of decompose things according to shuffle symmetries. Now you know the elements. So now you can think of decomposing every, a, a big Lego piece into its basic Lego pieces. And turns out that that is rather difficult, which is somewhat a bit surprising if you just believe me that this one here is easy. Um, and the precise formulation is the following. We want to decompose a product of shuffle symmetries. So somehow it's very easy to decompose uh, the triangle itself. The triangle itself will be just a one-dimensional and two-dimensional representation. Fine, the triangle itself will just uh, decompose. But to decomposing like a product, which is really, really trivial in some sense, you just put two triangles next to one another and have kind of the product action on them. So nothing really, really excitingly difficult, uh, but to decompose a product turns out to be essentially impossible, okay? So um, finding those coefficients that turn up in the product, so I take a product of my two things and kind of by abstract nonsense, I know that it must be a sum of my basic symmetries. So it must be a sum of this form. And I'm interested in the coefficient that appears. So how often does the basic symmetry appear? And it turns out that this is essentially impossible. And that's a Kronecker problem. And my theorem here would be exactly that, that it's essentially impossible. So even deciding whether they are non-zero is in general super difficult. So that's formally speaking, it's NP hot. That's super difficult. And computing them is, is just completely hopeless. Um, that's sharp P hot, that's even worse. So you can formally prove that computing those numbers, existence is very easy, but computing them is essentially impossible. And there's this complexity jump from computing them for one thing, just decompose one thing, that's kind of easy, or decompose a product of things. And you can't do that. Of course, if you can't decompose a product explicitly, you can't decompose a triple, and you can't decompose a quadruple or something like that. And really, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This kind of happens in the study of symmetries and representation theory quite a lot. So although you understand kind of the linear pieces, the decomposing product is like terribly difficult. And here, this is just the easiest example somehow of that phenomena because it is about the symmetric group in the end. Everyone likes the symmetric group. I hope you do like the symmetric group. Uh, I certainly do like the symmetric group. And it turns out, and here's the general philosophy again, if you kind of ignore everything I said before, uh, fine, fair enough, uh, that's fair enough to ignore me. But here's another maybe philosophy, another takeaway message. I just told you that these problems are essentially super difficult, NP hard and sharp P hard. I'm not even going into details what sharp P hard is, but NP hard is really sh shittily difficult. <laughs> so it's even more difficult than NP complete, which is already shittily difficult anyway. Um, but it turns out that a lot of difficult problems are somehow easy generically. They're easy on large subclasses. There are many examples of NP hard or NP complete problems that are just very easy to do. Uh, and that's as long as you ignore kind of the difficult parts. And the difficult parts is not, not a very large class. That's kind of the point. But my, my favorite example, Hamiltonian pass is one of the well-known, very difficult problems, finding a Hamiltonian pass in a, uh, in, a, in a graph. It's really terribly difficult. It's NP-complete as far as I remember. Uh, so in, diff in general, like no hope, and the fastest algorithms will all be horrible, um, horribly slow, I should say. The algorithms themselves are not horrible, but horribly slow. But it's easy for large subclasses, and it's kind of easy for generic graphs, and so on and so on. And the same happens for our funny coefficients G, which, by the way, are called the Kronecker coefficients, which is the title of this video. Anyway, the same happens here, and you will find like hundreds of papers computing them in special cases. And it's kind of very obscure, because you can do a lot of cases like that really a lot, very explicitly, you can write down nice formulas, but in general, it's just somewhat impossible. So that something is impossible in general shouldn't stop you. That's a takeaway message. You could still do it very often on very large classes or on random things or whatever. I mean, if it was random, I mean kind of arbitrary, generic uh, type of things. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll hope to see you next time.